Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome everyone to the echo session we have today on cannabis and palliative care, exploring benefits and considerations. Before uh, we begin our presentation, I would like to take the opportunity to acknowledge that the land on which I am presenting from, the city of Gatineau, is the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg people. I acknowledge the historical oppression of lands, cultures, and the original peoples in what we now know as Canada, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to be present in this territory. So just briefly, the Palliative Care ECHO Project is a five-year national initiative to cultivate communities of practice and establish continuous professional development among healthcare providers across Canada who care for patients with life-limiting illness. We invite you to stay connected with us and check out our website at www.echopalliative.com. And the Palliative Care ECHO Project is supported by a financial contribution from Health Canada. Therefore, the views expressed here do not necessarily represent the views of Health Canada. Many of you might know Pallium for our LEAP courses. Uh, our LEAP core uh, course program is an interprofessional course that focuses on the essential competencies to provide a palliative care approach. It can be delivered online or in person and is accredited by the CFPC and the Royal College. And we invite you to check out uh, the link that has been shared in the chat with you to learn more about the course um, and the topics covered. So I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Diana Vins. I'm the Palliative Care Echo Project Manager at Pallium. Uh, we do have Dr. Craig Goldie with us today. Um, Craig Goldie, would you like to present, present yourself briefly? Sure, thanks. Um, yeah, so I'm a palliative care physician in uh, Kingston, Ontario. Uh, I've been working here for 10 years, uh, mostly in the cancer program in the hospital. I uh, did my training in Vancouver. Thank you so much. We're so happy to have you with us today. Um, I'll briefly cover some of the conflict of interest. So Pallium Canada is a non-for-profit organization partially funded through a contribution by Health Canada. And we also generate funds to support operations and research and development from course registration fees, along with the sales of our pocketbook. I myself, along with the presenter, have the disclosures that you see on the slide in front of you. A few welcome and reminders. So I do see that the chat is uh, moving along quite nicely. It's so hot. nice to have um, all of you here. Please feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat as you're already doing. Um, and of course, feel free to use uh, the chat to comment amongst yourselves or any comments you may have. For any questions, uh, we would like to ask you to please put them into the Q&A function which is different than the chat function. You'll see it at the bottom if you hover at the bottom of your screen. Pop open the Q&A, throw in a question there, and we will address the questions towards the end of the presentation. Um, the session is, of course, being recorded and will be emailed to registrants within the next week. And please remember not to disclose any personal health information during the session as well. I will now pass it along to our presenter, Dr. Goldie. Hey, thank you very much. So, so this is a, a topic uh, near and dear to my heart. I've been, as I said, been doing palliative care for 10 years, and I trained in the early days, um, uh, actually 11 years, and I trained in the early days when cannabis was really difficult to access in the early um, MMAR timeframe where you needed to get uh, cannabis, either grow your own or get a very limited supply from uh, the Health Canada uh, mine in Flin Flon, Manitoba, uh, and it was a very slow process that was really difficult for palliative patients. So it's changed a lot uh, in that time frame, um, but uh, it remains a, a challenging topic and a lot of interest in uh, myths and misunderstandings. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the endocannabinoid system. I'm not going to go into the basic science, um, but just to sort of give an overview of why cannabis might be helpful in the areas that uh, people are hoping that it is. I'm going to go a pretty quick review of the literature. Um, I've done this topic a few times. Every time I do it, there's about, you know, 5,000 new publications on cannabis, although very little of its primary um, studies and, and, and new evidence, but it's a lot to go through, but we'll talk a bit about the new evidence. Um, I'm going to talk about the forms of cannabis administration. So 
Um, you know, obviously early days was all about uh, yeah, smoking or vaporizing it. Um, now there's a, a million formulations, especially in the recreational market with uh, edibles and drinks, pre-rolls, um, you know, topicals, transdermal patches. So it's changed quite a bit also in the last 10 years. And talk a bit about the basic principles of for safety, um, you know, both in, in administration uh, and in uh, advice for patients, um, because obviously with a recreational stream, people are going to be um, using cannabis th themselves, uh, and they may or may not be getting a prescription or uh, getting it through a licensed producer. So some of the basic considerations for safety are important. And I don't have any cases actually, but we do have time at the end for, for questions. Uh, an answer. So hopefully you guys will have some questions for me. So the endocannabinoid system uh, is an extremely priv primitive system uh, that's found in basically anything with a, a nervous system. And uh, it's a lot more abundant than the opioid receptors, which of course we use extensively for our, our opioid medications in um, pain control and dyspnea control in palliative care. But there's about 10 times more of these uh, CB1 and CB2 receptors in the, the body and this is not exclusive to uh, humans. This is actually being present in basically all vertebrates, and they keep going down and down historically. Uh, and it's actually found in a lot of invertebrates, including like nematode worms and all sorts of things with very primitive nervous systems. So this is clearly a uh, an ancient pathway that's been preserved uh, in, in evolution over time. And so it does have uh, a lot of potential functions and does seem to have a lot of functions uh, on memory, on sleep, on appetite and metabolism, pain perception and modulation, stress response, intestinal motility, executive function. Um, there appears to be effects on that um, with uh, either stimulation or inhibition of CB1 and CB2. Um, CB1, uh, CB1 is sort of the, the main receptor that we think is predominantly responsible for um, uh, symptom benefits, and that's mostly in the central nervous system, so the brain and spinal cord, which is, of course, where most of our uh, receptors for pain and nausea are that we that we work on. Um, and what it seems to do, it, it inhibits neuronal activity, so it works a little bit like um, uh, reducing uh, norepinephrine and dopamine and serotonin and GABA, so it's basically, you know, a, a more of an inhibitory process uh, rather than a stimulatory process. Um, and CB2 is predominantly found in the immune system. So that would be, um, you know, a lot of blood cells, the spleen, the immune system, and seems to modulate cytokines and immune cell uh, migration, which is why people have some thoughts that CB2 uh, and things that stimulate CB2 might help with uh, inflammation and possibly immune function. And we have two endogenous or homemade <laughs> cannabinoids uh, in our body. So 2-AG is uh, the one that's probably closest to THC. Um, so it's our natural one and it's uh, works on both CB1 and CB2 and it's very widespread. And then AEA, you can look up the acronyms. I always mispronounce it, so I don't bother to say the full name, uh, but it's uh, a CB1 agonist. Uh, and so both of them are, are widespread functions. And um, as I said, memory, sleep, appetite, metabolism, et cetera, and they've done lots of basic science in, in knockout mice models where they, you know, remove CB1 receptors or remove uh, their ability to make this. And there's a lot of effects on it, um, but it's a complex interplay, unfortunately. Um, so exogenous or things that come from the outside, we really have uh, two forms of, of cannabinoids. So we've got plant derived or what are called phytocannabinoids. Um, you might still hear the term marijuana. We really shouldn't be using that term because it's not actually a, a uh, a medical or a botanical term, actually. So cannabis is the, the plant, and there's a couple of varieties. There's sativa and indica, uh, and a few more, actually. Um, but that's uh, they produce a lot of cannabinoids, including THC and CBD and more, um, on the little trichomes, so the little tiny flowers of the female plant. And there's this uh, resin or oil where all of that uh, is, is produced. And then there's also... Uh, a, a, I don't want to call it a drug because it's also extracted from, from the cannabis plant, but there is uh, Sativex, which is Naviximols, which you can actually write a prescription for. Patients can get from a pharmacy, so it's a botanical extract, um, but it has a, a drug identification number. It's covered by private drug plans, et cetera. And there are two um, 
well, two available uh, cannabinoids that are uh, synthesized, um, only one in Canada, unfortunately. Um, so Marinol, which is, uh, is THC that's just made in a lab, so it's not derived from the plant itself, and it's just a pure THC isomer. And then uh, Nabilone is a, a THC mimic, so it looks like THC to the body, uh, but is uh, produced in a lab and uh, comes as a capsule. Uh, and those are both available in the U.S. In Canada, we only have Nabilone available. Marinol was taken off the market due to uh, financial reasons, not due to, to performance issues. And there are, of course, probably other experimental um, CB1, CB2 receptor medications that are that are um, in the still the, the preclinical phases. So uh, this is just an example of what the actual uh, cannabis plants look like. Cannabis sativa uh, was traditionally found in sort of wetter climates in, in uh, Indochina, mostly in the Chinese air, uh, side. Um, and indica plant was found more in the, the foothills of the Himalayas. Um, Traditionally, people talk about cannabis sativa as being higher in THC or more activating, so more uh, euphoria producing, more high producing, whereas indica was traditionally thought to be a little bit higher in CBD uh, and more for relaxing or sedation or sort of body buzz. Um, and so you'll still see that if you read um, on licensed producers or even in the recreational market, they'll talk about this being a sativa uh, strain or a, a indica strain or a, a hybrid, um, which is a mix of both of them. Um, and at this point, there's been so much extreme crossbreeding that really you can't say sativa is any particular characteristic or indica is any particular characteristic. But just so you know, you'll still see those terms. So cannabis sativa, cannabis indica don't actually tell you very much about what the cannabis that they're consuming is, but that's where it comes from historically. So for... Um, the, the main cannabinoid that, that people are interested in is THC or Delta-9 THC is what it actually is. And it works at both CB1 and CB2 receptors. And as such, it thought is it's uh, the main component of, of what we call psychoactive or the high producing part. Um, presumably it's also um, based on its CB1 work and analgesic, probably the antiemetic properties, muscle relaxant or antispasmodic, some thought that it could be anti-inflammatory. And it also works at a few other uh, non-CB1 receptors that are indicated in pain. So these TRP receptors are, are also a part of the pain pathway and it does seem to bind there. Uh, exactly how that works from a pain perspective remains uh, unclear, but it does have some effect there. And then CBD or cannabidiol is uh, non-psychoactive and that's pretty darn clear because you can take a whole lot of CBD and not get um, high per se. Um, thought to be anti-inflammatory, thought to be maybe a bit anxiolytic, possibly experimentally being interested as an antipsychotic um, because of its effects on um, dopamine. Uh, and it, it is an anticonvulsant in, in specific pediatric seizure disorders. There's quite good evidence for CBD in a very small subset of uh, um, seizure disorders. Uh, and then it seems to affect the metabolism of THC and modulate the THC a little bit. Um, so possibly reduce the psychoactive parts of, of C, uh, THC. Um, and it doesn't directly bind to CB1, CB2. And I'm not I'm really not going to get into the basic science because you need a, a, a um, physiologist, a basic science physiologist to explain it. But essentially it works uh, sort of beside the CB1 receptor. Uh, and uh, because of that, it sort of inhibits the binding of THC as well as actual um, the endogenous cannabinoids at it. So it appears to modulate, um, of course, THC, but also our endogenous ones. And so that seems to be its main effect rather than just binding to these receptors directly. And then to, to muddy the waters even more, and <laughs> one of the challenges is there's a lot of other cannabinoids um, produced in smaller amounts. So relatively speaking, um, they're probably sort of one to, to 10% of, of the cannabinoids by, by weight. Um, so cannabinol, cannabinochromine, cannabinol, uh, these are all uh, other can, can, cannabinoids that are similar to either THC or CBD, and they have very uncertain clinical properties. So there's the question of this entourage effect. If you have the whole plant, 
and you have all of these cannabinoids, is that in some way more than than THC alone or CBD alone or even a combination of the two? Um, and th that remains a little bit unclear. And then, of course, compounding it too is this is a plant. Um, there are the terpenes, which are a sort of odorous um, uh, organic chemicals. Uh, so myrcene is kind of that clovey, hoppy smell um, that's found in hops and in beer. Uh, limonene is citrus uh, linalool is uh, sort of a floral lavender. Um, and these are all terpenes that we consume in food all the time. But there's a question of do they also contribute in any way to um, the symptom benefits of cannabis, especially when it's ingested uh, rather than smoked. Uh, so it, it is complicated, and as such, it's been quite complicated to study, of course, because um, when you're studying a, a plant or a whole product, uh, studying it is difficult because uh, are you studying a specific amount of THC? Are you always using the same strain? Are you always using the same uh, root? Are you always using the same, um, you know, dosing administration? So one of the challenges is that there has been a whole lot of uh, research uh, done and trials done, but it's really hard to aggregate them together. And it's really hard to compare, um, you know, a study of inhaled, you know, THC from recreational markets uh, ages ago versus, you know, a CBD capsule uh, ingested today. So uh, we do the best we can. So we'll look a little bit at the chronic and cancer, uh, the cancer and chronic pain um, evidence. And so there's a few important papers and, and you guys can see these slides afterwards. So I'm not going to go into each of the study in great detail. And there's been a couple of systematic reviews that are quite recent. So a lot of the original trials were done in the last decade or so. Um, and um, the systematic reviews were done more recently. Um, it does seem in some of the important papers that there was an improvement uh, in pain um, and less opioids used in a few studies. So that MEDA study um, did show that nabilone seemed to reduce the uh, pain scores for patients. This was an uh, observational study. It wasn't, there's was no placebo part to it, which is obviously makes things difficult because there's always a big placebo response to um, pain trials. But it did show that there was a reduction in pain scores. It did show that people used less opioids when they were on the nabilone. It did seem to uh, also contribute to less nausea, less anxiety, because they're looking at other endpoints too. Um, so it seemed, you know, relatively positive. And then there were a few of the papers that were for Sativex, because there was a drug company, you know, funding these larger trials. So they used a few hundred patients that showed overall not everybody had a great response. If you took everybody that that used uh, Sativex spray, it didn't dramatically change the overall pain scores, but they did have, um, you know, about half the patients were considered a responder. So they had more than a 30% reduction in pain versus uh, about just 20% in the placebo group. So it does seem that there are some people who get a fairly good response, uh, but it's not universal uh, or not widely distributed across everybody. And then there's another couple studies that sort of showed similar um, uh, evidence um, in, in Sativex trials. And then they did a few other interesting ones. So they did some cohort studies where they just looked at um, people using it, not recreationally, but for their own purposes, but they looked at, you know, pain inventory, subscales, and sleep quality. And a fair number of them did seem to have improvements in sleep and some of them improvements in their general pain and discomfort. Um, and uh, so seemed to be helpful in some of these other cohorts. But unfortunately, in the sort of systematic reviews, uh, there's very uh, poor evidence for that. So uh, the Wang one in 2021 basically just says that there's a small to very small improvement in pain relief, physical functioning, and sleep quality uh, in patients, and that was chronic pain. Uh, and then the Nuri one is also said essentially the the uh, opioid sparing effect uh, of uh, cannabis remains uncertain because there's very poor evidence. So they can't really say that in aggregate, uh, cannabis seems to dramatically improve pain scores or reduce opioid, uh, which are the things that people are usually interested in it for. When it comes to neuropathic pain, which is where people thought or think that cannabis might be more helpful and, and one where, of course, our standard opioids and our other medications aren't quite as useful, um, it does seem to be 
uh, somewhat helpful, but again, uh, there's a few small studies of cannabis uh, and then dronabinol, which we don't have in Canada anymore, nab uh, nabilone, which we do in the big smalls. And both of them seem to show some improvement. So um, I'll say the nabilone study, because that's one that's widely used in Canada, uh, did show that they compared it to nabilone versus gabapentin, which we use routinely for chronic nerve pain. It did seem to be similarly effective uh, for pain and sleep. Uh, so it's not superior, but it's not inferior. And so somebody can't tolerate gabapentinoids, it's a reasonable thing to consider. But then the Cochrane Review, which is now uh, you know, five years old, says no high quality of evidence for any cannabis-based cannabis, cannabis -based medicine uh, in any condition for chronic neuropathic pain. So the Cochrane Review has a very high standard uh, of trials that they include. And so their conclusion is that there's no strong evidence there. Uh, for nausea, it does have relatively reasonable evidence, and that's actually one of the reasons why nabilone has uh, an ind indication for chemo-induced nausea vomiting. And so uh, it does seem that nabilone, uh, and this was mostly nabilone studies actually, or dronabinol, uh, did show that nabilone is at, at least as helpful uh, to some other nausea medications that we use, metoclopramide, uh, stematil, haldol, and so it did seem to be relatively similar. Um, and it didn't have a lot of harm, some dizziness and sedation, but not too, too much. And, and patients generally prefer uh, nabilone over the other medications, presumably because of anxiolytic benefits or sleep benefits or, or who knows. Um, but people seem to prefer generally nabilone to some of our other medications. Uh, and the Cochrane Review did say that cannabis-based medications may be useful for treating refractory chemo-induced nausea vomiting but they have uh, limited evidence to really support it. And also newer drugs that we use like um, a prepotent and olanzapine in chemo regimens have probably changed the need quite frankly for, for uh, nabilone because we're actually pretty good at managing chemo induced nausea vomiting. And the evidence is less clear for uh, all comer nausea. It's really for chemo that we have the evidence for. Uh, for cancer anorexia, which of course is where people are really interested in, in something to help because of course we don't have great options for, for anorexia and cachexia and cancer. Uh, and the, the public uh, knowledge of cannabis as an appetite stimulant for the munchies and things is quite strong. Um, so it's a tempting target, but unfortunately there really is very uh, limited evidence that it's helpful for anorexia. Um, it might be helpful for uh, the enjoyment of food, which I think is really valuable, even if people don't eat more food. So uh, there was a, a nice little paper uh, showing that the, uh, which is the Brisebois trial, which is dronabinol, which again, we don't have in Canada, but presumably cannabis or nabilone would be similar. It did show uh, that food appeal uh, was better, smell was better. They ate a tiny bit more, but not much. Uh, but they just enjoyed food. They would, you know, sit at the table with their family rather than be repelled by food, which is um, common for our patients. Um, but unfortunately, the, the actual evidence is that it improves appetite, but the ones that were placebo controlled showed that placebo worked well. In fact, that, that Strasser article at the top, um, it, the cannabis extract improved appetite in 73% of patients, but placebo was 69, going to show placebo is a very big part of uh, the benefit here. So for sleep, uh, the last time I did this talk, there was actually almost no evidence for sleep, but they've come more recently. Um, and so there's been a few uh, RCTs and a few non-randomized trials. And they're small studies, but relatively positive. So probably sleep is the one place where uh, there is relatively consistent support um, that it's helpful. There's a big question of whether it's, again, THC or CBD or the combination um, that's superior, we don't really know. Um, the CAFCARS trial, which was in my disclosure slide, that were one of the arms is uh, for sleep. So that's a THC, a CBD, a THC, CBD, and a placebo arm. Hopefully we'll uh, see if there's one particularly better. There's some thought that CBD might be good for um, basically helping uh, with um, REM sleep problems, nabilone and THC might help with nightmares associated with PTSD and other 
um, sleep that's interrupted by by pain. So there's some thoughts that maybe it's going to be helpful, maybe more indirectly from other reasons that people have poor sleep than just as a sleep initiator. Spasticity, I don't uh, deal with spasticity a lot. It's generally not a, a major palliative care consideration, more so it's uh, for uh, MS or, or ALS or other neuromuscular conditions. Um, but it's probably helpful, and Avalon does have an indication for spasticity in, M in MS. Um, and again, probably a lot of it's patient perception. So there's a few studies that showed uh, objective measures of um, uh, spasticity were not dramatically improved in any of these uh, trials, but <clears throat> that people uh, generally patient reported outcomes in terms of spasticity and pain and mobility were, were generally positive. So there's all, a bit of discord between, again, the objective measures and the subjective measures, which, you know, we care more about subjective measures in palliative care. Uh, and then there was, again, the, the review in 2018 did show that sufficient evidence that cannabinoids may be effective for symptoms of, they said, pain and or spasticity in MS. So in that particular condition, there's probably indications, but spasticity for all other uh, reasons, less clear, uh, but not unreasonable to consider it. Um, Anti-cancer. So of course, you know, one of the things our, our people are given a, a, you know, a terminal diagnosis of metastatic cancer, and they're always trying to figure out if they can treat their cancer. Of course, we've got chemo, immunotherapy, et cetera. Uh, but there are people who are trying to use cannabis to actually treat their cancer. And unfortunately, there's really no good evidence uh, in humans uh, that treating uh, cancer um, with cannabis uh, actually increases survival or can, can cure a cancer that's considered incurable. There are, again, preclinical data that's promising, which of course is where people hang their hat uh, if, they're, if they're desperate in that some cell cancer lines do express CB1 and CB2 receptors. There's mouse models. And of course, immune modulating properties of cannabis with sort of its CB2 work and the amazing success of, of immunotherapy in dramatically improving cancer survivals for a lot of cancers. It does make some, there's some plausibility that cannabis could be useful as an anti-cancer treatment, but there's no evidence to support that and uh, people who are trying to use very high doses of THC to treat their cancer um, often have a lot of harms from it. And so uh, if you ever hear people talk about Phoenix Tears or Rick Simpson oil, they're talking about incredibly high doses, hundreds of milligrams of THC that they're trying to consume every single day to, to cure their cancer. And I've seen a few people who uh, really struggle with um, the, the effects of that and, and being, quite frankly, so high they can't even talk to their family uh, while they go through this. And there's no evidence that it, that it actually uh, helps treat their cancer. Um, there was a very early, and you know, this is only a phase one trial that showed um, patients with glioblastoma, so brain tumor, uh, that took um, uh, Sativex did seem to show a little bit of a longer survival. So there were only 12 people in it. At one year, 83% um, of them were still alive in the, in the Sativex group versus 44% in the placebo group. But you really have to take this with a grain of salt because um, like the people, that, like in the placebo arm, two of the patients, there were only 12 patients total, two of the, the six that were in the placebo drop trial died within the first uh, month of enrollment, the first 40 days. So that completely changes the curves there. So, you know, it's not something that that I, I would encourage patients to, to consider that this is a good anti-cancer treatment. And there are certainly harms of it. Um, the other thing that's changed a lot, I'd say, in the last five years or so is, is patients' interest in CBD alone. People, uh, you know, have thought of CBD as the, as the less harmful part of cannabis because you're not going to get high, you're not going to get dizzy, you're not going to have, uh, you know, tachycardia, et cetera. And so a lot of people are trying to consider CBD um, for all of the symptoms. And so unfortunately, there's very little evidence. I, I will show a little bit of evidence uh, or a little bit of a, a negative trial next, but there's very little evidence for CBD alone for cancer, pain, nausea, sleep, mood, spasticity, anorexia. Um, there were no arms that had just CBD in there. Um, 
Uh, this actually, I should take out this no data yet. This palliative care trial, good and all, I should remove the no data yet. We do have data for that. That's actually what I'm talking about next. So apologize for that. Uh, but we do have a palliative care trial for CBD alone. And then there's a few other trials I'm looking at for autoimmune conditions, inflammatory conditions, um, because again, thought to be an anti-inflammatory. <clears throat> um, the only good evidence is actually comes from the pediatric epilepsy uh, due to Dravet syndrome or Lennox Gesto, um, but again, it's very specific ones. And then there is mixed data <clears throat> in some of the uh, psych um, uh, psychiatric illnesses there. So nothing that we could hang our hat on. And they did do, you know, uh, an audit of people who are getting CBD prescriptions in uh, New Zealand. New Zealand has a really good primary care research uh, organization, and so they can do these small little audits. Um, and they did have almost 400 patients with CBD prescription, only 100 of them completed assessments, but 70% felt CBD was good, very good, or excellent. And again, this is all comer, you know, quality of life, general symptom things. And so 30% didn't have a benefit but people were taking anything from sort of 30 to 40 milligrams to up to 300 milligrams a day of CBD. So wide variations. And so hard to, to really interpret that. And then this is the good study, uh, as I said, that, that, that came out um, and that was published just last year in Journal of Clinical Oncology. Uh, and so it was a good one because it was our patients. It was palliative care patients, advanced cancer patients that were seeing palliative specialists and they use things that we do all the time. So they used ESAS. Um, they, they did something a little unusual. I don't think anybody, maybe in the chat, you can tell me if you do this in your uh, practice, but we don't normally add the ESAS scores together. Of course, zero is always the best score, 10 is the worst, but they did uh, use their primary outcome was what they call symptom distress, which was they literally added all the ESAS scores together to give them a score out of, I think it was 100, because I think they had 10 items in their ESAS. Uh, and then the secondary analysis, they looked at individual symptom scores and patient determined doses and opioid use and uh, global impression of change and depression, anxiety, quality of life scores. So they did a good job. They did sort of what we would want to do, which is, is this actually helpful? And unfortunately, uh, their conclusion, this is the quotes here, CBD oil did not add value to the reduction in symptom distress provided by specialist palliative care alone. So it was a negative trial. And uh, you could say, well, maybe they just weren't using big doses. They, they were. People were taking a median dose of 400 milligrams of CBD per day, which is a lot. And so I don't think you could argue they just weren't taking enough. It was a good trial with lots of it, and it was not that helpful. So I generally say this is good enough for me to say I, I do not recommend CBD um, for symptom relief, uh, but... If people want to try it, that's fine, but we do have this paper to, to talk about it, and the evidence is not that great. So, I mean, if you combine it, and a lot of the studies will look at combining it, they sort of say, you know, can you find any trend of, of benefit for cannabis in, in any particular condition? And so there's a few of them, including a new one uh, that just came out last year, which is, which is wonderful. It's Cannabis and Palliative Care, a Systematic Review of Current Evidence. It is a wonderful paper. I highly suggest people look at it uh, if you have access um, through an, uh, uh, an account, um, but it sort of does summarize <clears throat> the evidence there. And unfortunately, the general conclusion of, of the previous ones is that there's moderate evidence for um, nausea, vomit, and spasticity. There's some disagreement whether there's any evidence for um, pain. Uh, the Whiting one in 2015 suggested there's moderate evidence for chronic pain. Um, the Allen one said there's, there's uncertainty about uh, pain. If it does, it's probably neuropathic pain. If it does, it's likely a very small benefit. And the other part is that they, they did talk about adverse effects because people think, you know, this is a plant, it's harmless, it's, you know, there's not any issues. Um, but the there are quite a few. So the number needed to harm in a lot of these trials or when they could when they could get aggregated together is, um, you know, that about one in five have to stop taking these things because of dizziness or sedation. Um, feeling high obviously depends on the, the THC dose, but about 50% uh, would feel high. That doesn't mean they all stopped it, but, you know, that can be a pleasant or unpleasant um, symptom for people. And so these are not completely benign uh, uh, substances. Um, so like I said, this is the, the paper that's really changed um, my conversations with patients that came out not very long ago. This is a year ago. 
Um, they looked at 52 studies, 20 of them were randomized, 32 were non-randomized, um, and they're looking at patients diagnosed with cancer uh, or end-stage dementia, um, HIV or AIDS, and spasticity. And then they had a very unusual symptom uh, syndrome called Norris syndrome with one uh, uh, study and one patient in there, which is interesting. Um, it was almost 5,000 participants total, although 4,500 of them were cancer ones, only 43 patients uh, were dementia patients. And so the quality of evidence, not too surprisingly, was felt to be low or very low in all the studies. And then uh, in the randomized clinical trials, uh, even then they said a lot of the, the quality was quite low because of missing endpoints or, you know, loss of follow-up and all sorts of things like that. Um, you know, it is quite hard to run these trials. Um, but they did look for, for positive treatment effects. And so they did see um, that in most of the, the uh, trials, they did see some positive treatment effects for pain, nausea, vomiting, appetite, interestingly, sleep, fatigue, this chemosensory perception, the smell and taste of food, um, perineoplastic night sweats. Uh, so that was in cancer patients. Um, surprisingly, because this is thought to be something that you'd see even if there was no particular benefits like that, there might be just a general quality of life benefit. But across all the included studies, they didn't see a positive treatment effect for quality of life, overall impression of change and satisfaction amongst cancer patients. So surprisingly, when they take everybody together, they don't actually seem to have dramatic quality of life or even satisfaction benefits with cannabis. They did show an appetite and agitation benefit for inpatients with dementia. Again, hard to extrapolate that to everybody, and there's only 43 patients in it but did seem to be helpful. And there are a few papers for um, behaviors of advanced dementia that do show that uh, cannabinoids can be helpful for that as a, a, a you know, a, a neuroleptic uh, sparing benefit, possibly especially if pain is maybe part of the reason for agitation, cannabis might be helpful for that. And it did show appetite, nausea, vomiting uh, benefits in patients with uh, AIDS and HIV. Again, not huge numbers in Canada and not even huge numbers in the trials, but it seems to be helpful. And, and one thing that you try to do in a systematic review is if you can, you try to <clears throat> add all the studies together to have, you know, really big numbers and do what's called a meta-analysis where you, where you look at it, but they could not do that because such variety of cannabis products, such different study outcomes, such different uh, dosing and endpoints that basically they can't um, combine these. So even though there's actually quite a few studies, uh, you can't really add them together uh, to get a better answer than any one of the studies uh, separately. So we can do these reviews, but we can't do a, a meta-analysis, um, which is a challenge. And so again, harms, you know, I, I think cannabis certainly has some, some benefits and it's certainly reasonable to trial it um, for people who aren't having good symptom control from our standard medications. Um, but there are some harms and generally they're quite mild, but up to 10% of patients withdrew from cannabis trials because of adverse effects, which is about three times higher than the, the placebo rate. So people still withdraw from, from placebo harms, uh, but there is definitely a threefold difference in, in that. Mostly, as I said, dizziness, dry mouth, sedation, and feeling high. Um, uh, and uh, so, you know, again, uh, the most common are those. The most problematic, arguably, are similar, which would be dizziness, confusion, somnolence, drowsiness, uh, disorientation, balance issues, and, and paranoia. And so they talked about the number needed to harm with adverse effects is about six. Um, and then to withdraw uh, would be about 14. So, um, yeah. So these would be uh, potential harms. I can see Olga, you're talking in the chat about these risks. Are these risks or harms? Um, well, I mean, we talk about number needed to harm. Uh, you could argue whether it's, these are all risks and I don't know if I would call them side effects. I guess you could argue they're side effects, um, but they, they can be enough that people can be harmed from it. And uh, it's difficult. There's never been good data from these trials in terms of absolute harms, in terms of you know hospitalization rates and things like that. So it, it is difficult to say um, that there are, concerns that these are not benign medications, I think would be the best way to put it. Um, and, uh, you know, there are also what I would call financial harms, uh, you know, which is that people have to generally pay for these. These are not 
medications that would be covered by most uh, drug um, plans. There are, you know, some private insurance that would cover things like uh, Sativex, uh, and there are a few patients that do have ac access to uh, health spending plans where they get licensed producer covered cannabis. Uh, and abalone is widely available, but there are financial harms if people want to try uh, THC and CBD products um, from a licensed producer, they have to pay for it directly. Um, so, you know, it's not expensive, but it's also not cheap. And so people who have very limited finances might struggle with that. Um, there is the risk that some people would avoid, you know, so-called regular medications uh, with more solid evidence base and experience. So I haven't had a lot of patients that would avoid opioids for pain control in, in one in cannabis, but there are patients who uh, would not use our standard, you know, antiemetics, which we have pretty good evidence for and also good experience with. And so that's a potential. Um, I haven't had a lot of those patients, um, you know, which is fine. Um, the inability to drive, um, the, there is, uh, in Ontario, there there is a challenge um, that you're not supposed to drive within at least six hours of ingestion of cannabis. And it's a pretty challenging situation. It's THC. Um, you know, if you had to do a, a sobriety test, it's a THC blood uh, analysis that they do. And of course, there's very tricky uh, um, correlation between, uh, you know, intoxication from THC and actual driving ability. And so it's a whole mess, but there's generally a, a, an inability to drive when on cannabis that doesn't exist necessarily with our other medications, including opioids, because it's actually fairly clear evidence for opioids, stable dose, uh, being able to drive. And not to say that cannabis is more impairing, uh, but the, the, there is a challenge in patients not being able to drive. So for instance, in our calf cars trial, uh, you can't drive within six hours of ingestion. And so if it's being used on a regular basis, you know, multiple times a day for a particular cancer symptom that would essentially render somebody unable to drive at all, uh, unless they're taking it just for sleep at nighttime. And then again, avoidance or delay of cancer-directed treatment. It's not something that I see very often, but there are patients who would, um, you know, avoid uh, getting, you know, chemotherapy and treatment and try for cancer uh, cure from that. So it's one of the issues. Uh, and so there are some potential harms too, because there are some concerns that it could affect um, immunotherapy, specifically the, the new immunotherapy checkpoint inhibitors. And there are some drug interactions, and I'm not going to go too extensively into it, but there are some interactions at higher doses of THC and CBD that do uh, inhibit some of the, um, the CYP P450 system that uh, interacts with our drugs. And so it's not an issue with their opioids, uh, but it is an issue with some of our medications, things like Haldol and fentanyl and midazolam. Um, uh, there can be effects. And there was a, a case report, actually, the last time I did this, that somebody uh, had a patient on methadone that started taking high-dose CBD, and then the methadone uh, level spiked significantly, and they actually ended up hospitalized. So not a huge issue, but at high doses probably is something that needs to be considered. And since these are available over the counter, that's uh, something that can, that uh, are recreationally that needs to be thought of when people are taking it. And again, uh, you know, the Supportive Care and Cancer uh, National Society recommended against the use of ca uh, cannabinoids as an adjuvant analgesic for cancer pain, suggesting that the potential risk of harms have to be considered. So it's not a uh, a ringing endorsement. It's also not saying that you shouldn't use it. It's just that a lot of the uh, larger societies and groups are, are you know, less positive about it, I would say. So we'll go into the forms of cannabis administration. Just it's uh, inhaled, ingested, sublingual, topical, and now transdermal actually. Um, and so generally speaking, the inhaled is obviously the fastest route of administration. Uh, ingestion is is uh, a little bit slower. You can see the times for onset and duration of effects there. Sublingual is probably my preferred um, route if, if people are able to tolerate sublingual because it avoids the first pass metabolism. And THC is metabolized in the liver to um, uh, delta 11 uh, THC uh, or 11 OH THC, which is also psychoactive. And so some people would probably have a little bit more um, you know, high feeling from uh, oral versus a sublingual, um, but the benefit of THC would be would be similar. 
And so we do tend to use sublingual, and that's actually in our cannabis trial, a sublingual administration. Topical, there's, uh, there's rapid local onset uh, in terms of um, going below the skin, but that's a challenge, and then transdermal. Uh, so my preferred administration would be uh, sublingual oil or sprays, uh, as long as I can tolerate it. There's sort of rapid uh, and predictable absorption, less airway irritation. I'm not a fan of inhaled or even vaporized. Less um, metabolite that may be psychoactive, and then a more rapid onset uh, and probably a bit shorter duration of action. So probably a bit more useful for, for um, PRN uh, administration. Um, but it can be a little bit hard to hold sublingually. It's not huge volumes, but it can irritate the mucosa if it's alcohol-based. And it's a little bit harder to measure and administer. You have to drop the oil um, in a syringe and, and a dropper versus, you know, the pre-made capsules of 2.5 or 5 milligrams that you can get from the dispensaries are uh, quite easy. Um, so where do you start? I mean, that's a real challenge. Generally, the, the lack of evidence is that um, there really is no right answer. I would say, like everything, we start low and go quite slow. Um, we start sort of about 2.5 to 5 milligrams of THC and or CBD uh, per that. Um, they, they, there's a question of how much the uh, CBD counteracts it. There was one uh, trial that came out a year ago looking at healthy volunteers that were taking THC um, ingested THC, and then either no CBD, the same amount, like a one-to-one -one ratio, a two-to-one or a three-to-one CBD to THC. It didn't actually seem to have any effect on the, <clears throat> the cognitive issues um, uh, or physiologic effects. And so we still suggest it's probably good to have CBD, but it is a question, uh, what is the right ratio? So I tend to stick with one-to-one, -one, but there's nothing absolutely set in stone about that. Um, the maximums, as I said, for most of the studies that use THC, it was about 30 milligrams or less. So uh, NAB alone, most of the studies were uh, up to six milligrams per day, uh, but the studies were mostly about three milligrams per day or less, so one BID or TID. Um, <clears throat> and then the dibixabols were, were about max 12 sprays per day, which is 32 milligrams of THC. There's 2.7 every spray. Um, and then Marinol, which I said we don't have here, would be about 20 milligrams per day. So most of the studies were relatively low doses of THC. Uh, and then CBD maximums unclear. Um, in the trials for seizure disorders, people were in the sort of two to 500 milligram doses, huge doses. And as I said, that one study of CBD uh, in our patients uh, were up to like average 400 milligrams. So people seem to be able to tolerate high doses of CBD without a lot of problems. Uh, but normally it would be probably in the tens of milligrams that you would be considering. And so access right now uh, is through ACMPR if you want to get uh, cannabis through a licensed producer. Uh, and of course we can write prescriptions for Nabilone and uh, Sativex. Sativex not being covered by a lot of uh, our provincial insurance uh, programs. Nabilone is. Uh, patients can get uh, cannabis through recreational markets in, across Canada. Um, and then, uh, of course, they can grow their own. And then there are a lot of gray market dispensaries um, uh, available that are still selling it, technically not illegally because they're not recreational, uh, getting it through the, the provincial governments and they're not uh, licensed producers. Um, so there, there's lots of ways. Um, the ACMPR, you need to consult with the healthcare provider. A medical document is completed, they register with a licensed producer, uh, they order it and it's mailed to their, uh, either your office as a prescriber or to the um, to their, their house, which is the preferred, of course. Um, and it's a relatively quick process, but it's not uh, quite as quick as just going to your local uh, cannabis dispensary nearby. And so who asks for medical prescriptions? Uh, my caveat is, is I have only done one in the last three or four years. Uh, it's really if people may get drug coverage uh, for their cannabis um, or get it reimbursed by a health spending plan um, or Veterans Affairs. Um, it can be written off as a medical expense if they get it um, uh, through a licensed producer versus if they just get it from a recreational store. And some people still have a stigma around cannabis, and so they want to make sure it's all very clear that it's licensed producer, prescribed, monitored by, by a, a physician or MP, um, rather than just getting it from the recreational store. Although the, the quality um, and, and 
potency is not that different between the two different routes. Um, the packaging in recreational stores is, is quite small. You can't get sort of large uh, doses, but it's not that different. And as an example, um, I just looked up cannabis oil from one of the local licensed producers. It's $90 for a 40 mil bottle. It's about 50 cents per dose if you're talking about 2.5 milligrams of THC, which is a low dose. Um, at uh, the, one of the local dispensaries here in Kingston, they have a Black Friday sale. And so it was $20 for a 30 mil bottle. Uh, and, uh, and so it was about 30 cents uh, or so. So it was a smaller bottle, um, you know, but it was was a little bit cheaper. And so people are often choosing that. And then Nabilone, again, covered by, by drug plans is quite cheap. So, um, you know, there, there are different ways of doing it. I still think the licensed producers is the best way to go if somebody's going to be using it regularly. They're much more likely to continue to have the same strain available once they find a, a, a product that works well for them. It's, it's definitely a, a good relationship if it's going to be long term. But as a trial, most people will go to the recreational producers or, quite frankly, the gray market uh, to get uh, options. So the basic principle of safety, again, the, the evidence base is still really fairly poor, uh, but there is uh, a signal, especially in that um, review in 2022, that, that it can be helpful. And so while we don't have really strong evidence that it's incredibly helpful, we also don't have a lot of evidence that it's really not helpful. And whether you slice it as patient reported outcomes, quality of life scores, specific symptom scores, people uh, do often find it helpful. Um, and so if the conventional medications are either not well tolerated or effective, it is, I still think, quite a reasonable thing to consider. And so in the interest uh, of uh, trying it, low doses, not talking about uh, driving, like everything we do, trials of it and uh, monitor for side effects and benefits. Uh, we watch closely. Uh, we reassess the benefits routinely and objectively using things like ESAS or symptom diaries. And we do consider some drug interactions. So I apologize. I only left five minutes, but I did want to leave a little bit of time uh, for Q&A at the end. Of course. Thank you so much, Dr. Goldie. It's so insightful, um, as always. I'll uh, read a couple of the questions that have populated in the Q&A to allow you to answer. So the first one is from Lynn Curry. Any research supporting dementia irritability? Yeah, so again, that, that uh, uh, JPSM uh, 2022 paper has a few studies in there, and, and it's a great review because if you can actually get that paper, it, of course, it's a systematic review. It shows you all the papers of dementia patients. So for BPSD, there is some evidence that it can be helpful um, for uh, dementia agitation. Um, the trials are, are difficult. They didn't compare it against sort of our normal treatments of, you know, lanzapine and quetiapine. And so, um, and, and they're very small numbers. As I said, all the studies combined um, were only 43 patients. Um, and so there's mostly, you know, there's a few case reports and things, but I do think that uh, it, it could be helpful. And again, our other medications do have a fair number of harms. Uh, I'll say anecdotally, I, I present on cannabis at our local palliative care course every year. And there are a number of physicians who work in long-term care that, that attend, and a lot of them have tried it, and a lot of them feel that it's been quite helpful uh, for their patients. So again, anecdote is not evidence, but I do think that, yes, it's a reasonable thing to consider. But once again, you know, this is not a benign medication or benign substance. It, it has to be looked at overall. Uh, and, you know, generally, you'd have to use fairly objective measures uh, to see if it was helpful in a short time frame rather than just start it and, and go at it. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Um, from uh, Helen uh, Dantini, we have, how does CBD affect dopamine? Would it be good for ADHD? That's a great question. Again, it, it's, if you look at the, the basics science, it's really uh, not clear. CBD does not uh, have very strong uh, supports because it, as you know, we, we don't have a great way of studying uh, dopamine overall. There's no clear evidence that it would be helpful for ADHD. I don't think anybody's actually studied it for that. Um, and again, the, the papers of CBD for uh, schizophrenia and other dopamine mediated uh, psychiatric conditions are relatively uh, weak, but it does seem to uh, actually uh, antagonize dopamine in a similar way to the way that works for serotonin and um, GABA or it actually increases GABA, but it's, it, 
I don't have a good answer for that, unfortunately. Uh, these basic science questions are, are very challenging um, because it's so complicated. Of course. No, it's fine. Um, our next question um, is for pain slash sleep, regardless of the evidence, I almost never say no when a patient at end of life is asking for cannabis prescription. However, I have heard that patients that have used cannabis in the past, such as uh, smoked weed in the 70s, uh, smiley face inserted, may have a better response. Any anecdotal evidence there? Um. I, I can't, I can't say one way or another. I mean, I don't, I don't know that that previous use is, is begets a, a better response or not. Um, I would agree. I mean, if people have sleep and, and uh, pain issues at night, obviously, you know, we, we still usually normal use our normal, uh, you know, medications or opioids or, or mirtazapines or, or whatever. But um, I do think it's a very reasonable thing to trial. I've never noticed a signal between people who used it in the in the sort of 70s and 80s and if they benefit. But to be honest, I don't always ask about, you know, distant historical use of, of cannabis. I do find people who use it recreationally, obviously it's difficult because I've got, you know, you have people who were smoking, you know, hundreds of milligrams uh, per day of um, THC, CBD, and it's harder uh, to sort of give them a, a relatively higher dose uh, to be helpful from this perspective. Okay. From uh, Sharon Van Broek, we have, would you recommend clients try cannabis in conjunction with traditional medications or alone? Um, well, I don't like to start two things at once. So um, there's, again, it doesn't interfere with uh, THC, or sorry, with uh, morphine and hydromorphone. So I generally want people to be open to using our conventional medications. Um, so, and normally I will, will, you know, use our standard treatments or standard antiemetics or standard sleep medication or standard pain medications, but if it's not working particularly well, or they have a really strong, uh, interest in trying it, then I would hold those other medications stable if they're providing some benefit and then add cannabis on top of it. So you, you can be on both. Um, but mm -hmm. obviously if you change two things at once, it's very difficult to interpret the, the benefit of either of them or the hard or the side effects. Yeah. Okay. Um, another question we have, I think it's fair to say that patients may use recreation cannabis, knowing that how do we reduce the stigma of the stoner um, when supporting patients to cope with pain and harms from cancer mm -hmm. treatments? Yeah, I mean, I think, again, is, is an open conversation. I think it's really Part of it is destigmatizing, is not talking about uh, about marijuana, is talking about uh, their use. If people are using it, I, I ask what they're using it for. Some people are using it for recreational purposes to be high, um, but often they are using it for self-perceived benefit as an anxiolytic or for nausea or for appetite. And I think, again, it's an open, a non-judgmental conversation and, and hope that people will disclose it. I do say, you know, it's important for me to know what you're what you're using. Um, you know, just so that I'm aware. And so if they're taking THC or CBD, I try to, to ask how much and what the dose is. And I have that in the chart. And I think that's useful information. Um, and I think that the image of the stoner is, is disappearing a little bit. I can't say I, I think that that is quite as common because, uh, you know, even the older generation is using quite a bit more CBD or more open to it. So I do say, you know, people use this for symptom benefits, the evidence base uh, it remains um, challenging to interpret, but I think it's completely reasonable to try it for your own symptom benefit. I also just want to say, I think it's really important to give people permission to, to not try it if they're being pressured into it. Because I still hear quite a bit that people, you know, have a nephew, it's traditionally a nephew that really wants them to take, you know, THC for their, their cancer nausea. And I say, you know, look, if you really want to try it, that's fine. But like, if you would rather use you know, our metoclopramide or lanzapine or, or, or our standard antiemetics, like that is great. We, we use them every single day. And, and having been in this, in this realm for 10 or 11 years, I, I can't say that cannabis has been the difference between really good symptom control and really bad symptom control for any individual patients. It's always helped a few people a, a bit, but it's never replaced, you know, all the other medications that we use. And so I say, you know, if you want to try it absolutely um but if you want 
permission to say like, no, nephew, I don't really want to use cannabis. I want medical bromide, which was what was recommended, then that's totally fine too. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, the next one um, from Christopher Han, um, we often see the usage of Navalone in LTC nursing to manage aggressive behaviors and dementia driven behaviors. Should this happen? Navalone is discontinued in the US. Do you predict the same will happen in Canada? I I don't know much about the business decisions, uh, you know, and obviously being in palliative care, I, I don't feel like I've got the full breadth of of Navalone prescriptions. I do see it widespread used in chronic pain, uh, and I think in primary care it's still fairly used. Um, I I again the the evidence supports a signal that it can be helpful for dementia, appetite and dementia behaviors. Um, it's less clear for pain, and of course you know, in advanced dementia, pain scoring is really difficult. You have to use, you know, scales like pain AD and you can't use ESAS scores. Um, so I, I do expect that, I don't expect it to be discontinued. I think it's widespread used enough um, to make it worthwhile. Although we are such a small market, it's, we're always at the behest of the US. Um, yeah. if, if it doesn't work in, in, in a place 10 times as big, it's often an issue here. Uh, I haven't heard anything about it being discontinued. I think, you know, cannabis will always be readily available, whether it's Navalone or not. Um, Navalone just obviously a lot easier to get in, in your standard LTC with, you know, your medications coming from a pharmacy and blister packing and all that stuff versus cannabis extracts or oils or things like that. Yeah. Um, as I said, I don't work in LTC that often. And so I can't speak to it. The, the, the evidence would suggest that it probably is helpful, but it's still very early evidence and I'm not sure that it would replace your standard management, but we all know that antipsychotics have significant risks in LTC as well, but so does non-treatment of, of severe behavior issues. And cannabis, I suppose, arguably has the potential to help if part of the aggression is pain, part of the aggression uh, is nausea, part of the aggression relates to any other symptoms. Um, <clears throat> and, and the sedation side is relatively low compared to the antipsychotics. And so I, I don't think it's unreasonable to trial it as an alternative, but it's not in any of the, the guidelines in geriatrics at this point. Okay. And then, um, well, this is regarding Navalone as well. I don't know if you did, did cover it. Um, is the, so there is research supporting that it Navalone is aiding in dementia aggravated behaviors? I'd mean? have to look back. I think it was Marinol that was studied in the cannabis extract. I, I apologize. I don't actually remember if the the trials that were used in the dementia patients uh, in the JPSM study was Navalone itself. Uh, I'd okay. have to look at the primary source. As yeah. I said, that that is probably the single best article you can use for cannabis from my perspective, because it really does summarize a lot of evidence in a lot of patient populations and specifically for palliative care, including dementia. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'd have to look at what the doses were, were used in that study. It's a great paper, though, and it has, you know, obviously all the references to the original uh, publications. Okay. There's two more to go. So we have, um, is a one-on-one -on -one CBD to THC uh, ratio still considered a good ratio to start with or aim for? Yeah, it, it is. And, and again, you know, the, the evidence base for that is relatively poor, um, and, and there was that study, again, healthy volunteers is not the same patient population, but I think, I still think one-to-one -one is, is a, a, probably a good place to start, you know, is, is a, you know, five to four or a, you know, three to two ratio that different? I mean, no, probably not. And I guess probably a lot depends on what, what is available from the licensed producer or wherever you're getting it. Um, but I still think one-to-one -one is a, a pretty good place to start. And that's what I usually recommend. Fantastic. And um, our last question, it says, thank you for an excellent review. Is there any evidence for use in dyspnea plus or minus opioids? Uh, so dyspnea, no, there's no evidence uh, for it. And, and quite frankly, I don't think it would be very helpful for dyspnea because one of the things about um, the, the CB1 receptor is they're not um, extensive in any of the respiratory um, pathways. Um, and so it's safer from the sense that there's really no, no harm from a respiratory standpoint. You could take probably, you know, thousands of milligrams of THC and never have respiratory depression. 
but the reverse of that is probably it's not particularly helpful for the sensation of dyspnea. So there's no evidence. And to be honest, I wouldn't expect it to be helpful for dyspnea directly. But of course, anxiety is a huge part of dyspnea. And again, cannabis is considered to be somewhat helpful. So just like benzos aren't our mainstay for, for dyspnea management, opioids are. Um, if there's a huge anxiety component, I can imagine cannabis might be helpful for, for that part of it, but it would not replace opioids as the dyspnea management mainstay. Okay. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Goldie, for taking the time uh, for this wonderful presentation. And also all the, uh, the questions were uh, phenomenal. Um, you've answered um, all of them so thoroughly. Uh, thank you to all the participants that have joined us today. Uh, we have included into the chat a feedback survey following the session. We always love to hear from you uh, to see how the session went um, and get your, uh, get your thoughts. Um, once again, thank you, everyone, and uh, we look forward to seeing you at our um, next ECHO session. Thank you so much.